All right, so this is the first video in the AP uh, review sessions. Uh, and we're going all the way back to the beginning of the year. And we're going to be talking about unit one, which is kinematics. And I'm going to give you a brief walkthrough about every single thing that we did with the kinematics uh, unit, which for some of you will bring back some terrible, terrible nightmares and some terrible, terrible memories. But for those of you planning and taking the AP physics exam, hopefully this will help quite a bit. All right, so first thing, where do we start, right? This is our first time in physics class. We had no idea what to do. So the very first thing we did was actually quite simple, is we took the concept of an object. An object's just hanging out, right? There's me, I'm hanging out, right? And we're like, well, we got to be a little bit more specific. So we kind of went through and we're like, okay, well, he's standing on the ground, right? Let's make this the zero point. This will be the positive direction. This is the negative direction. Oh, but what if he's going up, right? We also have positive and negative. Somehow if I'm going down, I guess, I don't know. So we're like, let's establish a coordinate system. So this is positive X, positive Y, negative Y, negative X, right? So we took this and we're like, all right, well, this is the five point. Well, we can't have five, right? We're like, no, that's the five meter point. And I'm like 1.8 meters tall, something like that. And then that makes this the negative five meter point. And this is the negative three meter point, whatever. So the point is, is we took this physical situation, like where I'm standing, and we established a coordinate system. And we needed to do that because if we want to quantify nature, we have to be able to associate some uh, some things with that. So super easy, right? We did that. Um, we talked about a few other things. We talked about sig figs, right? Sig figs, not a huge thing in physics class. It's the degree at which you know an, a number. We talked about precision and accuracy. We talked about calculating percent error. We talked about uh, calculating your uncertainty value, right? We did a lot of things, unit conversions. We did a lot of things in the first unit that I would consider more scientific skills and less about actual physics. But they they go they do they do build some background. So what did we actually start talking about? What we actually started talking about was when I have this object that object especially if it's me, it's not just going to hang around all day, right? That object's going to move. And if that object moves, kinematics, the concept of kinematics is being able to predict and quantify how that object moves. But in order for it to move, we talked about a few things. We talked about like displacement or distance traveled. It travels throughout a time interval. Um, it travels with some speed. Well, not only does it travel with speed, if it travels in the, to the right in the positive direction, well, then it has speed and direction, a.k.a. velocity. And um, we got into a little bit, with, and we got into a little bit of the concept of acceleration. So these are some of the main things that outline what's going on or some of our vocabulary that helps us understand what exactly is going on. So from that point, we broke motion into two concepts. We broke it into uniform motion and we broke it into non-uniform motion. So two types of motion. Uniform motion, um, we called constant velocity. And non-uniform motion we called constant acceleration. So all motion cannot be quantified or broken into those two categories, right? There's also a third category, and that is non-uniform acceleration. And the reason that we don't cover non-uniform acceleration 
minus the concept of simple harmonic motion or oscillations. We don't cover non-uniform acceleration strictly because the math is beyond our, beyond our capabilities in an algebra-based physics class. Now, if you take calc-based physics, yes, absolutely. How are you going to do things? Well, you're going to integrate. Oops, that was not an integrate symbol. You're going to integrate things from 0 to t in, re in respect to dt, or you're going to take a derivative, dx over dt. Some of you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. And that's totally fine because this is algebra-based physics. So outside of uniform circular motion, we're not going to worry about this at all. So let's jump into our first case, which would be, of course, uniform motion. So with uniform motion, we did a lab, which was like a car. Let me draw my car here. I'll make it a pickup. And that car is moving. And um, if you recall, we used actually a dune buggy to do this. And we could examine it, and the very, very, very first thing we did, because this is what helps us make equations, is we made graphs. So the graphs we started off with were position versus time and velocity versus time. So the whole concept of uniform motion is that the object is moving at a constant velocity. So either of these graphs I could tackle first. Uh, let's, go, let's go to our velocity versus time graph. Now, if it's uniform motion, constant velocity, that means that I have a constant line. And, or position versus time, I am going away from the origin, because in this case I'm going in the positive x direction, and I am going at a constant rate. So I get a linear position versus time and a horizontal velocity versus time. Very, very simple. Well, from that, I can start to formulate equations, okay? And I do that by using two concepts. We use the slope, and we use the, or as I like to say, starts with the letter M. That's a, that's a flash joke for you. Uh, so we use the concept of slope, and we use the concept of area under the curve. And that actually relates our position versus time to our velocity versus time graph. So to get some equations, let's use these two concepts. The first one, let's use the slope of position versus time. Well, that would be right here, right? It's rise over run. So here's my run, here's my rise. Well, the slope of position versus time it always helps describe your next graph. The slope describes your next graph. And again, that's a calculus thing, but we're, we're okay, right? So my slope is my velocity. And the rise would be my change in my position. And my run would be my change in time. And that got us our first equation, that velocity is displacement or distance traveled over time. Now, as we all know, delta x is xf minus xi. Delta t, we're not going to break down. Delta t, we're going to just call our time interval. Uh, but that gives us another equation that xf equals xi plus v delta t. And again, v is not changing, so there's no vi or vf. We'll get into that in the next section. So um, that gave us that equation as well. And uh, in, a, in a second, I'll, I'll walk through all these. Um, similarly we have the area under the curve of velocity versus time. And let's say I'm looking for this chunk right here, right? That's the area under the curve. Well, that's going to be my displacement. And the displacement in this case is a square. So the displacement, the area under the curve represents the previous graph. So my displacement, it's not my position, it is my change in position. So remember, when, whenever we're doing stuff with area under the curve, I don't know if I'm starting it right here, or I'm starting it here, or I'm starting it here. Where does this, where is this TI where, and TF, right? Where is it? I don't know. So whenever I do area under the curve, there is no final position. It's just a change in position. And that's delta X, and that's going to be my, the square, right? So my height of the square is velocity, and the length of the square is time. And you might say, didn't we do that already? Of course we did. It's the same thing as this guy right here. It's just rearranged. 
So we use the slope and the area under the curve to examine that. So let's take a look at, at these couple of equations, and I'm going to walk you through exactly what they tell us, right? Equation number one here, my velocity is my displacement traveled over my time, which means that if I go 65 miles in one hour, I am traveling 65 miles an hour. All right, that's mind-blowing. Okay, what about, the, what about the, let's take a look at this next equation right here. My displacement. Ooh, okay, so what's the difference between distance and displacement? And here's my example. My displacement. If I go 65 miles an hour for three hours, 65 miles an hour for three hours, well, if I do 65 times three, that's 195 miles. So I have traveled 195 miles. Where am I? Right? Where am I? Well, I'm 195 miles away from where I started. Where did I start? I don't know. And that's the difference between this and our third equation right here. Super similar. But let's say I started one mile away from my house. And I traveled 65 miles per hour for three hours. Now I am 196 miles from my house. Equation two said I traveled 195 miles. Equation three tells me where exactly I am. So sometimes I can know how far I've gone, but not where I am. And those are the difference in the two equations. If I ask for displacement, that's equation two here. If I wanna know where I am, that is equation three. All right, nice and confused, awesome. Uh, that's, what we, that's why we struggled so much at the beginning of the year, right? Because there's so many weird intricacies linking the concepts of the quantification, the mathematical portion, and the explanation, like actually saying what's going on. So that was it, that was actually super easy, right? That was it for uniform motion, three super similar, super easy equations. So what was the next thing? Well, the next thing we get into is non-uniform motion. Non-uniform motion. And all this means is that it has acceleration. And we did a lot of different stuff with non-uniform motion, right? We did the speeding up, slowing down lab where you like push the cart up a, a ramp and you got some like weird graphs or you let it go down the ramp or you let it, you push it up and you let it go up and down the ramp, right? We did all these different graphs to kind of get you thinking about what exactly is going on with non-uniform motion. And that was all, of course, just an extension of gravity. So with non-uniform motion, the very first one I actually looked at um, was the concept of the, uh, the you remember the, the wind-up pickup trucks, right? Those wind-up pickup trucks traveled across because they were a wind-up toy. And those are supposed to, allegedly, have relatively constant acceleration. So let's set up our three graphs again. Our position versus time, our velocity versus time, and our acceleration versus time. Wow, I am doing such a great job of drawing these graphs. Now, again, where we start doesn't really matter. I could start at any of the three graphs that I want. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, I'm going to start with the uh, acceleration versus time graph. And here's why. Again, this is algebra-based physics. So I'm going to go ahead and say that this is our acceleration versus time graph. It is a constant non-zero acceleration. Why is that important? Um, I'll be able to undo this in a second. This is not our acceleration versus time graph. That is a lot more complex. We're not going to do that. This is not our acceleration versus time graph. Again, too complex for what we're doing. We're keeping it simple with just this linear acceleration versus time. 
okay? Well, again, I can use the concept of the slopes. I can use the concepts of talking about stuff um, to help kind of understand the other two graphs. So the, the next one I want to talk about then is velocity. Well, if I have a constant acceleration, right? That means I'm getting faster and faster at a constant rate. So if I started with no velocity, I am going to speed up at a constant rate. So what that means is that I'm, I'm moving faster and faster. Well, how does that translate then to position versus time? Well, if I'm moving faster and faster, I'm going further and further at each successive time interval, which means that I am going exponentially away from where I started. Now, we did spend some time talking about how we get from graph to graph, right? Taking the slope, taking the area under the curve, what an instantaneous slope, remember that instantaneous velocity, that, that means that at this point right here, the slope of the line is my velocity at that point, right? So there's a lot more mathematical things that we did to help explain everything. But again, this is the cliff note section, session, so uh, we're not going to get super in-depth here. But let's go ahead then and take a look at um, where babies, I mean formulas, come from. And they, again, they come from the concept of slope and area under the curve. So first graph, let's take a look at it. Area under the curve. We never do anything with area under the curve with position versus time. Because remember, area under the curve always represents the previous graph. Slope represents the next graph. So with my position versus time graph, I will not take a area under the curve, but I will take a look at its slope. And the slope, well, that's difficult, isn't it? I can't really do much with it. Why? Because the slope is changing, which means that I can't really take a look at the slope at that time. Now, there are some, there is some important applications that come from it, but we'll take a look at that with the next graph. So the only thing I can really do with slope is I can describe it, which will help describe my velocity versus time. So here, for example, my slope is positive and the magnitude of the slope is increasing, which means that my velocity is positive and increasing. So I can describe it that way as well. All right, so now we're on the velocity versus time graph. And my slope of velocity, wow, that's way easier, right? I have, again, a linear line. So the slope of velocity gives us our equation. And it tells us the next graph. And that tells us our acceleration. Now, our acceleration, the slope is rise over run. The rise is our change in velocity. The run is our time interval. And just like before, Vf equals minus v, delta V equals Vf minus Vi over delta T. So I can get that equation as well. If I know what, what my initial velocity is, um, I can get my final velocity as well. We'll talk about that again in just a second. Well, what about the area under the curve? And with the velocity versus time graph, that is a little tricky, but it gives us one of our most important equations. Here I have a rectangle, here I have a triangle. Now the area under the curve represents the previous graph, which will give us our displacement. That's the area under the curve. It represents the previous graph. So the displacement will be the sum of the two areas under the curve. So what I have then, the first area, let's say at the bottom area, that curve would be the height. Ooh, well, how high is it? Well, the height is my initial velocity, and the 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 width would be the time interval. And then the second one is a triangle, so it's one half, my base, which is also my time interval, and my new height. Well, that's really weird. What is that? Well, that's the difference between my initial height and my final height, aka the rise in that, um, which is the change in velocity, which I can get from the previous equation. So it's one half acceleration times time or it's acceleration times time will be my, my new height. So what does that give us if I manipulate these? Well, it's delta x equals vi delta t plus one half a delta t squared. So let's just get rid of this guy. 
right? Um, this one probably doesn't look familiar to you. What you probably remember is that delta x equals xf minus xi. So I could also have xf equals xi plus vi delta t plus one half a delta t squared. So let's get rid of this guy too. So this is one of my most fundamental equations with non-uniform motion. It tells us if I started one meter away from my house and I go at three meters per second, my initial velocity is three meters per second for five seconds, but I'm accelerating at this rate, I could tell you where, how far I am from my house, right? So that's what that equation does. All right, let's go to then to the uh, our last graph, our acceleration versus time graph. Well, the area under the curve, uh, as you can see, it doesn't go to another graph. Um, it actually, it does. It goes to what's called a jerk. It's an instantaneous change in acceleration. Again, not covered in the scope and sequence of this class because this graph doesn't change at all. So we don't have to worry about that. So we're not going to worry about the slope, but again, we can look at the area under the curve. Well, the area under the curve represents the change in velocity. So my change in velocity is my acceleration times my time interval. Or I could say VF equals VI plus A delta T. So all of these are equations that can help us describe our um, non-uniform motion. Now, yeah, I'm going to do this next. I'm going to talk about one real quick set of special case equations. Finally, there is one last equation um, that uses kind of the combination of these two, and that is that VF squared equals VI squared plus 2A delta X. So we do have one extra equation, and this one comes into use quite a bit if we're caring about the displacement and how it relates to the initial and final velocity. So one last little equation to kind of throw into that. So there's one quick special case equation and that is what happens with my velocity versus time graph if I start at rest or my velocity versus time graph if I end at rest. So or we're not going to have an arrow going here. We're going to have it literally going here. Well, these, these two graphs do actually give us a couple of special case equations. Why? Because they give us nice little triangles, and we know the area under the curve represents our delta x. So if I have something, an object starting from rest, then the displacement is one half, well, the slope of this line is a, one v delta t. What v is this? This would be, well, if it's the area under the curve, it's got to be vf. So if I start, if vi equals zero, meaning I start from rest, I get this special case equation that my displacement is one half VF delta T, okay? What if I end at rest? Well, then I'm, I'm, I'm assuming if VF equals zero, then I can also do it similarly. And then I know my displacement is one half, well, the height of it at this time is VI delta T. So these are two special case equations. If I start at rest or if I end at rest, I can get my displacement from the area under the curve of the velocity versus time graph compared to my xf equals xi plus vit plus one half a delta t squared. So what's the difference? Um, well, they both actually work but I can actually get these two without knowing the rate of acceleration. So it's just some special case equations that we did briefly talk about um, with the uh, non-uniform motion equations. <sighs> All right, what else do we got? We got one more thing. Actually, we have several more things. That was a lie. Um, we did got into some applications. So quickly, I'm going to talk about a couple applications of non-uniform and uniform motion. Our first application we got into was super easy, and that is the concept of free falling. If I'm free falling, hold on, I'll get that in a second. Boom! If I'm free falling, we assume all objects, regardless of their math, math, math all objects, regardless of their mass, as they're falling, accelerate at the same rate. And the rate at which they accelerate is g. 
and the magnitude of G is 9.80 meters per second squared. Or, because we're nice and smart slash super lazy, 10 meters per second squared. Now, what's the direction? The direction of the acceleration is always towards the center of the Earth, all right? Which is really difficult if you believe the Earth is flat. But acceleration is always directed towards the center of the Earth. Now, I do things when I'm solving physics problems to make my life easier. Sometimes I say, this is my zero point, and this is the positive y direction. In that case, my acceleration is positive 9.80 meters per second squared. G itself is positive. The magnitude of G is positive. The direction, whether it's positive or negative, depends on how you set up your problem. So let me say, let me do it a different way. Let me say, this is the zero point and this is a hundred meter tall cliff. Well now, A, it's going in the negative direction and it's speeding up. So I have negative 9.80 meters per second squared, right? So it depends on how you set up the problem. And that was the concept of free fall. Another concept we did, very similar to free fall, also pretty simple, was motion on a ramp. And if I were to draw a ramp here, which can only go well, and this is my uh, signature move here, always being that exact proportion short on my triangle. Um, as the object goes down the ramp or traverses the ramp, we're assuming first off that the object is not rolling, it is sliding, and more importantly, it's sliding without friction. These are things that we will talk about in our next unit. Well, it's going down the ramp, and it's got some acceleration. We'll call that acceleration in the x direction. Well, we know from free fall that acceleration g is always down towards the center of the earth. And if I were to quick dot this up a little bit, drawing a line normal or perpendicular to the surface, this angle right here inside this triangle, due to being alternate interior angles with the ramp itself has the same angle. So here is my AX. There is some Y component of acceleration that brings it into the ramp, so it doesn't actually accelerate. Uh, it produces what's called a normal force. Again, something we talk about in the next unit. Then AX is technically opposite of my angle, and G is the hypotenuse of my angle. So that means that AX equals G opposite hypotenuse means sine theta. So this is a special case equation. Uh, well, it's not really a special case. If an object is sliding down the ramp, it accelerates down the ramp with a magnitude of G sine theta. So the greater this angle of the ramp, the greater the magnitude of the acceleration until my ramp is vertical, in which case I would be in free fall, and then AX would be G sine of 90, which is one, so AX at that point would be G. Well, duh, because that's free fall. So motion on a ramp. All right, the very last one was everyone's definite least favorite because there are so many things going on with this. So we have one last application, and then we'll be pretty set. So our last application got into the concept of what happens when I throw something through the air. And that gets us into projectile motion. And projectile motion is a, it's a simple yet difficult thing. And the point is, if I, something has an initial velocity, right? Um, there's a few different ways that I can think about that. And we broke projectile motion into three categories. The first category was, what happens if I throw something horizontally off of a tall building or something? Well, it's going to follow this path, okay? It follows a projectile path. I could also have, my second one was, what happens if I launch something, right? Uh, let me draw the ground here, at, at the ground, and it ends at the same height. Okay, and then my third example was, 
what happens if, again, if I'm on that building and I launch something at an angle? So kind of combining the two. Okay, those are our three different types of projectile motion. Now, there are a couple things going on. We have to break things down into X components and Y components because it's moving in both the X and the Y direction. But there's something that they share. What they share is time. So if it's moving in the X direction and Y direction, time is what brings them together. It can't be moving longer in the X direction than it does in the Y direction. The time in the air must be the same. So we break everything down into uh, components. Anything in the X direction, well, I did a bunch of demos to prove this, but the X direction is all uniform motion, which means it has no acceleration. So I use my equations like delta X equals VX delta T. All right, that's it. X, X stuff has to be uniform motion. Well, okay, well, that's easy enough. Sweet. The Y stuff is going to be an extension of free fall, which means that a Y equals G, the acceleration of the Y direction equals G. And I use things like, I use all my non-uniform motion equations. So non-uniform equations. And instead of X's, though, I use Y's, like YF equals YI plus VI Y t plus one half a not a sorry g t squared right so i use my non-uniform equations to uh to determine the t in the y direction and i link that with the t in the x direction so the time is the same for both and in my three minute nutshell that is projectile motion we did go through and solve these um but I'm not gonna do any of those now. Instead, if we go back to the uh, equation sheet, which is right here, we have the cheat sheet of what's going on. So in this sheet, I did go ahead and say, um, all right, here's my half projectile, here's my full projectile, and here's my combination projectile. And I put together some really quick, um, how do we, solve these equations. I have special case equations, like the T down equation, right? And I use that um, a couple times, right there and right here. I also have some other helpful things like a T up equation, right? And these equations, I call them special case equations, but really they're not. They're just, they're just taking uh, a couple of our kinematics kinematic equations and solving them for specific variables that what it is, oops, uh, specific variables of what it is that we are looking for. And with that, I just completely, um, absolutely demolished um, my picture. Uh, can I change that? And uh, that about sums up our first unit. So kinematics the quantification of the motion of particles. Um, and that, that is an important concept is particles. Particles meaning I can take an object and treat it like one point. That differs from later on in the year when we talk about rotational motion, which is when I go from the particle model of how we treating treating stuff to what is known as the rigid body model. So we actually have to change some stuff around as we start to learn more. Now, this leads us into our next unit and everything with non-uniform motion, there's something that has to be in equations, except for our two little special case equations. Something has to be in the equation because it defines non-uniform motion. And that is, of course, acceleration. So acceleration, what is it? What causes it? Well, forces cause it. And we'll take a look at forces in unit two, dynamics. We'll see that in the next segment.